My name is Melinda Brown Donovan. I'm the Associate Director for Continuing Education for the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. Welcome to our seventh annual Ministry Renewal Day. This day has been a tradition at Boston College since 2004. It was first offered by the Institute of Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry, and the School of Theology and Ministry is very pleased to be continuing that tradition. Ministry Renewal Day is part of our year-long on-campus continuing education program organized around the theme of hope for healing. Today's topic of reclaiming Catholicism is, addresses one step in the process of communal healing. This annual Ministry Renewal Day is our gift to you, those of you who faithfully serve the church in this area. It is our hope that you will immerse yourself in the, the prayer, the learning, and the community of this day and come away energized and refreshed for your ministry. Now our new Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry will introduce our speakers. He is Father Mark Massa, a Jesuit priest, a scholar, and a professor of church history. Good morning. Um, I'm the new kid on the block. Uh, just came up from New York City. So as my students would say to me, I say to you, don't hit me, I'm brand new here. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to Boston College in the name of the School of Theology and Ministry this morning uh, and introduce to you two of our stars, um, Sister Margaret Guider, Meg Guider, to those of us who know and love her, is a member of the Sisters of St. Francis of Mary Immaculate, which is, has its mother house in Joliet, Illinois. She is currently serving a four-year term of office as the vice president and counselor for the mission of her congregation. She holds doctoral degrees in theology from Harvard University, a license in sacred theology from the Western Jesuit School of Theology, a master's degree in theology from the Catholic Theological Union, as well as dual degrees in education from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Meg cur currently serves as associate professor of missiology at the BC School of Theology and Ministry. Previously, she was a lay missionary associate with the Joliet Franciscans in the rural interior of Brazil um, in the mid-1970s, and in the 1980s, she ministered in the Archdiocese of Chicago as Associate Director of the Catholic Missions Office and as Catholic Chaplain for the Cook County Juvenile Detention Center. In 1990, we are delighted that she came to us and is now a member of the School of Theology and Ministry. Meg is the author of Daughters of Rahab, Prostitution and the Church of Liberation in Brazil, which was published in 1996 by Fortress Press, as well as numerous chapters, articles, and reviews that have appeared in edited volumes, scholarly journals, and the pastorally-oriented publications. She is also the past president of the American Society of Missiology, and has worked extensively as a theological consultant. Well, maybe she should be Dean, Meg. Do you want to say? <laughs> Tom Groom was born in County Kildare, Ireland, and holds the equivalent of a master's degree in divinity from St. Patrick's Seminary in Carlow, Ireland, and master's and doctoral degrees in religious education from my own former institution, Fordham University, and the Union Theological Seminary with Columbia University, respectively. Tom is the Senior Professor of Theology and Religious Education and has taught at Boston College since 1976. In addition to his teaching responsibilities, Tom is the Chair of the IREPM, now the DREPM Department, within the STM. Tom, as all of you know, is an acclaimed author with a long list of books and religion curricula to his credit. In addition, Tom has written more than 180 articles. I want to pause there and say it again. More than 180 articles and essays for scholarly journals and popular publications on religious education and pastoral ministry. Tom developed the shared Christian praxis pedagogy one that is rooted in experience and reflection 
aligned with scripture and tradition and designed for action. This approach forms the framework for leading religious education materials today. During his sabbatical year, during the last academic year, 2009-10, Tom wrote the book, Will There Be Faith?, which will be published this coming spring, 2011, by Harper and Rowe in San Francisco. He also has co-edited the book, Reclaiming Catholicism, Treasures New and Old, published this year by Orbis Press, which is also available for sale from the, board, from the BC Bookstore at the entrance. Please join me in welcoming two of the STM stars, Meg Geider and Tom Grimm. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for coming out so early on a Friday morning. We're delighted with our new dean, and, and uh, this is above and beyond the call of duty, but thank you for the gracious invitation. I'm delighted to welcome you as well, and I'm delighted to be working working with my, my old friend, that's old in the Irish sense of endearment, uh, it's, not a, it's not a chronological report, my old friend Meg Guider and my new colleague at the STM. So Meg, we're going to do a, a tag team today and we'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment, but we'll have Meg say hello first. No, she's still trying to get the technology to work, I don't blame her. Isn't it amazing how codependent we, oh look at this, oh my God. Pennies from heaven. Um, now, I wonder will the clicker work? I'm really pushing my luck now. Okay. Wow, we. Yeah, I didn't expect this. Meg's a genius at technology, as you can see. Maybe we'll plug it in, or maybe it will. Who knows? Reclaiming Catholicism. What a great idea. Let me give you a sense of the structure of the day together. We'll basically, it'll be in four parts. It'll be a day in four parts. And we've really designed this day, as Melinda said, really to be a time of R&R &R for you, uh, for old friends to meet and greet and make new friends as well, and for us to be a resource for you in this month of mid-November. Mid uh, you know, you start off with great energy and enthusiasm, at least I do, in early September, but then by mid-November, you know, a morning off and out and about and a cup of coffee with friends might be a good idea. It's not quite as bad as February, but, you know, November, mid-November is getting there. And um, so that's what we're going to do together. So it'll be, it'll be, it'll be uh, hopefully a gracious and a graceful time for you. Uh, we're basically going to do it in four parts. Um, I will start off with some opening remarks after Meg has had a greeting with you um, on this theme of reclaiming Catholicism. And then we'll have a little reflection time with you uh, together at the tables and with us together. And then there'll be part B then, Meg will come in with an introduction to the whole thematic of reclaiming Mary, such a central symbol to our Catholic Christian faith. Uh, reclaiming Mary, what would be the process of retrieving or re-knowing or renewing or whatever we're going to call it, a devotion to Mary in our, in our Catholic faith. So that'll be part B. Then we'll take a break time. Then part C, Meg will proceed after laying out some principles. She will then move to some specifics uh, around devotion to Mary, what Mary might mean for, the, for our faith. And then part four, A, B, C, D, I will return with some more comments. So basically, you'll have Meg and B and C, myself and A and D, and who knows, we'll all get confused. And we'll talk to each other lots of times along the way as well. Does it sound like a good agenda for the morning? It's the only one that I think we're going to get up here. <laughs> so whether you like it or not, it's probably what you're going to get. Do you want to just say hello first and then we'll launch for it? Well, it's my pleasure this morning to be able to work with Tom Groom. We've, as Tom said, we've worked together on a couple of other projects, and it's wonderful to see faces that are familiar and some new faces for me as well. I think uh, the program that we've tried to put together this morning would like to model for you uh, being in conversation, being in dialogue about issues of significance and importance for us, both in ministry as well as in our own spiritual growth and development and our own ways of understanding our positioning um, within the church at this moment in time. So I think uh, on with the show. Hey, thanks, Meg. Thank you. How about the word reclaiming? Catholicism. What comes to mind for you immediately? Because it may not be the best word. It's the word we're going to work with this morning, and I'll tell you why I picked it originally for a title of this collection of essays that just appeared. I'm not, we're not advertising the collection. Actually, 
the, the day, what did we see? We didn't do the day just because there's a book about it. We did the, for better reasons. But we, when, we were, when, I, uh, when I chose this title, Reclaiming, I was trying to say something with it. But what does it say to you immediately? A couple of thoughts. Pardon? Something was lost, yes, yeah, something lost or could be lost, and at least it's still possible to reclaim it. Lovely uh, association yourself. Yes, there's something. Yeah, there's, uh, something you had, didn't quite see the value, lost it, lots of it got lost, and yet maybe we should re re go and, as you said, take it back and take another look at it, because there could be gems, there could be treasures there. there. There could be. Now, there'll be old treasures, there could be new treasures. Yourself. Ownership, Ownership. yes, that's a lovely association, that it really is ours. Uh, this faith belongs to us. Um, and nobody can really, nobody's entitled for sure to take it away or to deny it to us or to um, alienate us from it. It is ours by birthright. We call it baptism, but it's birthright here. Yes. Another association? Yourself. Yeah, a recognition, a recognition, which, of course, is seeing again. Cognition is to see, but recognition is to see again. And, and almost as if for the first time, um, as, as the poet put it. You know, that, that, that wonderful uh, verse at the end of uh, the third quartet, I believe, in Little Gidding, where, um, who's the poet, Shelley? No. C.S. Eliot. Eliot says, you know, we go around and we come back again. And there's stuff that maybe when we find it the second time, we'll actually know it as if for the first time. So, and so much of life is like that, don't we agree? Those of us who have a little mileage behind us, uh, we come around again and you say, oh my God, I didn't never saw that before, you know? Uh, you know, you've, you've said Psalm 23 a thousand times, the Lord is my shepherd, but then you find yourself on your back in hospital after an operation and you start saying it as if you'd never said it before. I mean, you know it at a whole new level. That can happen with any aspect of our faith tradition, yourself. Coming more in depth, it could, it could be an in-depth thing type of thing. Yes, indeed, it could. Good positive associations. One more and we'll pass on. Yes, it, it is renewing. It's not just repeating. And it's not just regressing. It's not going back to do it again the same old way. So there is, that's a lovely aspect to raise up. There is a newness to it. Now, it could be coming out of old sources. Uh, that extraordinary line in Matthew's Gospel, th Matthew 13, verse 51, I believe, um, where Jesus says that the scribe learned in the reign of God. Isn't that a lovely description of how, how, who any of us aspire to become? A scribe learned in the reign of God is like a, the head of a household who can take from and one translation has the, tr the, the storeroom, but the new RSV translation can take from the treasury. And actually, Dan Harrington has told me the treasury is a better translation there, so definitely treasury is a better translation there. Uh, Dan knows uh, his New Testament, shall we say. But it's like the head of a household who can go to the treasury, to go to the treasure room, and take from it both the new and the old. So in a sense, that will always be our task as, 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 as a pilgrim people of God coming down through time to go to the treasury frequently and to reclaim from it the treasures. Some of them will be old, old treasures, indeed, that we will always cherish, but some of them will be new possibilities or renewed possibilities, as my friend here is saying. Well, let me tell you why I picked the word. I actually, well, one, one, one night, my, I, this probably never happened to you, of course, my car got towed, and the policeman who was standing there told me that I could reclaim it. Uh, told me where to go and how to get there and how much to bring with me, about $150. So that was one ex experience of reclaiming that I didn't want to revisit. I had a, a more elegant one. When I was a child growing up in a, on a farm in the middle of Ireland, as you probably know by now, um, there was a bog across the way. And the bog, of course, is where the Irish cut their turf. And the turf is, makes wonderful uh, fuel uh, for their fires. And, and people draw their fuel from these bogs. 
if they lived for another million years, they'd become coal. So uh, turf is kind of premature coal. But this bog got cut away. The people gradually, each person in the village had a, a plot of bog. And you went there in, in, the, in May and you cut your turf and laid it out to dry and then came back in, in mid-summer and, and put it into little stacks and then to, for it to dry better and then came back in, in the harvest time to bring it home. And you did this wonderful firing, this wonderful fuel for the winter. And I mean, a good smell, the smell of a turf fire is like idyllic. It's like apple pie. It's, it's, it's just a wonderful odor when you walk into a home. It's not like coal at all. It's a wonderful, fresh, almost, a, almost like a perfumed odor. So it's a wonderful fuel, a great firing, delightful fire, etc., etc. Well, anyway, gradually the bog got cut away uh, and then fell into disuse and became overgrown. Uh, and there was all, it was dangerous as well. As children, we were always warned, no, don't go into that bog, because there were all kinds of bog holes. Because when the people would dig their turf, sometimes they'd go down 30, 40 feet, and then there was nothing with which to fill the bog hole in with, so the water filled it in in the wintertime, but you could easily get drowned in a bog. Lots of kids were. If you rambled off into the bog, you could fall into a bog hole. So it was a dangerous place. But it lay there for, oh, another 40 or 50 years until my childhood, and then the government decided to reclaim the bog. And I remember this big sign going up straight across from our farm, from our home, uh, reclamation, government reclamation project. And I remember saying to my mom, hey, what does reclamation mean? And she started explaining the word reclaiming, that they were hoping to find something else there. They weren't going looking for turf again because the turf was all gone. And yet there was tremendous soil there that could be reclaimed. And that's precisely what the government did with this bog. They reclaimed it. They turned it into forestry, growing wonderful Christmas trees and palm trees and, and, and fir trees and all kinds of balsamic firs and what have you, but also into a market gardening uh, area. And that bog now produces lots of fruit and vegetables for the market in Dublin. So in other words, it became wonderfully fertile again. Didn't go back to how it was and the way it was. and didn't, We didn't go back to cutting turf there. And yet there was still tremendous richness, potential, possibility, fertile soil awaiting reclamation. So that's where I got the word originally, the association of reclaiming Catholicism and going back to these treasures old and new. I think between regressive restoration and facile forgetting, we have to find a middle ground. Because it is easy, and there are people... Uh, whom I'm sure God loves, and on my better days, whom I love as well, who are in favor, greatly in favor, of regressive restorationism in our church at this point in time. Let's simply go back and do it the way we always did. It worked fine. And of course, we were a burgeoning, uh, successful church at that time. And so why not go back to the Baltimore Catechism? Well, we had 422 questions and answers uh, about our faith, and we thought we knew our faith. Now, maybe that's, the, why not go back and simply repeat that? There's very good reasons not to go back and repeat that. Uh, there was seven questions and answers on where did Jesus spend his time between three o'clock Friday afternoon and Easter Sunday morning, as if anybody was wondering or asking. There was, <laughs> there was 11 questions and answers on limbo and purgatory, and there was none on Easter. So, Yes, it had strengths, it had wonderful questions and some wonderful answers. Why? Remember, let's see how many still do. Why did God make you? Forever in the next, absolutely. But it was a great question, it was a great answer. God made us to know, to love, and to serve. The head, the heart, the hands. Our faith is a whole affair. It engages every bit and piece and aspect and nook and cranny of our lives. That's what our faith is. That's what especially what Catholic faith is about. Great question, great answer. But then it also had other, other very, pro, very uh, ambiguous or ambivalent or, or problematic answers. There are 13 questions and answers on how to gain and, and not lose indulgences. Partial indulgences, total indulgences, how many how for the Pope's intentions. So, and then, of course, there was nothing there, nothing in the, in the Baltimore Catechism but the Bible. We were biblically illiterate. So to go back to that is not wise. And yet, was there some old wisdom there? 
Was there an old practice there of memorizing certain core dogmas, doctrines, symbols, lists, categories of our faith that we still should know by heart? The creed, the Ten Commandments, the seven sacraments, the divinity and humanity of Jesus, the three persons in one God. Are, are there not core symbols of our faith that we would be dreadfully impoverished if we didn't know them by heart? And I don't mean just by rote. They should be at the very heart of who we are. And we should be able to share them with people when called upon or when, if we're in a, in a, in defending our faith. Uh, we should know those resources. So, in other words, to go back to it would be simply restorationism, excessive to an nth degree, and yet, was there an old wisdom there that we would really be foolish to leave behind and that maybe we should still bring with us? So that in between fa re regressive restorationism or simply dismissing that silly old catechism that was so ridiculous, no. I mean, the faith of our mothers and fathers were nurtured by that old catechism. Now, the, it, was, the, it wasn't nurtured only by that old catechism. It was nurtured by parents who said rosaries and mornings and night prayers and told us great stories and modeled great values and virtues and Catholic identity to us. So our faith never depended on the catechism. And yet, catechetically, could, that, could there still be a role for memorization? I think there probably could be. Uh, and I say that very clearly. Actually, I wrote the essay, as you might expect, on the catechism. And that's why I know all my statistics and why I looked up how many questions and answers on indulgences and all the rest of it. So we need to, in other words, a reclaiming that brings with us what was of value, and not, but yet not simply a return or a repeat. It's interesting, the great image of God's people that comes to us out of the Hebrew Scriptures, especially in, of course, the Second Vatican Council revised this, is as a pilgrim people of God. Now, a pilgrim people of God do not move round and round in circles. It's not a rerun or a repeat but rather we're always leaning forward into the reign of God that's coming to meet us. The eschaton, God's ultimate promise of shalom, God's Je Jesus' promise of fullness of life for all, and so on. So we have to be a pilgrim people, but we should bring with us the wisdom that has emerged along the way. Otherwise, it will be tremendous. Then otherwise, we will become a wandering, aimless people who don't quite know where we've come from, and if you don't know where you've come from, you're not likely to know how to, where you're going, and how to get there either. So instead of something new, uh, we, we need to bring it forth as something new or renewed, to be fresh, to be life-giving. Um, I've already used this text of, from Matthew 15, or 13, rather, 52. I always loved his conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well, where he promises her living waters, that this gospel of his will always be life-giving. And again, Dan Harrington is my source here. Dan's door office is next door to mine, which is such a living resource, a living magisterium of, of New Testament scholarship. But he says, a typical translation, that it'll always be springing up to eternal life. And Dan says the word there is better translated as gushing. This, 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 this gospel should always be as fresh water. It should never be stagnant or staid water or putrid water. That stuff kills, kills. And there are ways to take our beloved faith and indeed make it sound as if it is putrid and stagnant water. It's not. It has to be tremendously life-giving water with a wonderful outlook on life. It's, we think of it as sacramental with an extraordinary understanding of ourselves made in the image and likeness of God, alive by the divine breath, called into community together to be a body of Christ in the world for the reign of God of justice and peace and wholeness and fullness of life. A tremendous spirituality that we have in this Catholic Christian tradition of ours. When I meet young people, and I, did, I taught undergrads here for 27 years, who say to me, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not religious, but I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Have you, hands up all who have heard that, at least a hundred times. I'm spiritual, but not religious. My response to them is, that's the best news I've heard in a long time, because we've got an extraordinary spirituality for you. That's what Catholic Christian, that's what Christian faith is. It's a spirituality, Catholic faith in particular. An extraordinary spirituality, a way to put, take your faith and put it to work in the ordinary, in the everyday of life. Uh, sustained by God's grace and empowered by God's spirit and the, with, the, with the spirit constantly up to something in our lives and us to discern what she's up to and to respond to it appropriately. I mean, it's an extraordinary way to live if we ever would get on with it. I mean, just imagine the extraordinary person I would be if I would follow the way of Jesus of Nazareth. 
I mean, how loving, how kind, how faith-filled, how hopeful, how integrated, how compassionate, how inclusive, how hospitable, how you name it. Amazing way to live. So this extraordinary richness that is there, but it always has to be living water. And we are gatekeepers of this. Because uh, very often the people that we mediate this, scripture, this great gospel to, indeed, are looking for living waters, are dying literally, for living waters, and living, hopefully, out of the waters that we can provide. Uh, to, to deny the value of traditions, I'm winding down, I'm going to ask you a question, and then call on my colleague, Meg. Um, to deny the value of traditions, to say that they were all wrong or misguided, really is a way of saying that God was misleading our foremothers and forefathers in faith. Uh, and that, of course, if we can't trust the God of our parents and grandparents, we probably shouldn't trust the God of our time either. So God was not misleading uh, our four parents in faith. The traditions, the customs, they can mediate great spiritual wisdom from one age to another. Now, this is an important point. I don't want in any way to whitewash our past. I make it sound as if that's just nostalgia. It doesn't give life. It's misleaded. It's misguided. It's a refusal to grow up. Uh, our past was far from perfect. Uh, there were some traditions we had some traditions and practices and perspectives that were definitely wise for their time, but, pardon me, may not be nearly as wise or as effective for our time. So there may have been a dated practice. There were practices that indeed are, will be wise, I think, for all time. They'll always be wise. And I think we had some practices that were never wise. They weren't wise long ago, and they're still not wise today. Let me give you an example of each. Some that were wise for their time and place. I often think of Anselm's way of talking about cur Deus homo. Why did God become a person? This extraordinary truth claim we make that our God became one of ourselves in Jesus of Nazareth. And Anselm asked the great question. Of course, it had been asked for a thousand years before him. It's been asked for a thousand years since then. Why? Why did God become a person in Jesus? In other words, what was it, what's the meaning of the Paschal mystery for our lives? In the context of his time, Anselm had the sense that Jesus had somehow paid the price for us. That, and he used a very feudal, medieval feudal kind of imagery. That was the word of his time. He said it's as if a vassal had offended an overlord, or an overlord had offended a king or queen. If you had, then reality had been put into disarray. And you'd have to rebalance. Somebody would have to pay the price for that for that imbalance that was created, that, 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 uh, that offense that was made, because the world had been knocked out of kilter, as it were, and somebody had to pay the price. Anselm was very careful to say, Jesus was not paying the price to the devil, because we owe the devil nothing, even though there's a whole tradition of thinking about we were in the, in the bondage of the devil, and Jesus came to free us and to save us from the powers of evil. But uh, Anselm wanted to say, no, he, more, he kind of set things right again. And he used the analogy that when the, when the Moors would come in and, and capture people and take them hostage, you had to pay a price to get them back. So your wife or your daughter or children got taken hostage by, by very often, in his world, it was, the, it was the Moors, but it was whoever, you know, enemy that came in and took, took away your children and wife. Well, you had to pay a price. You had to buy them back. So Anselm said, that's what Jesus did for us. And, of course, there were lots of good scripture texts he could quote to... to, to, to to buttress his position. It worked very fine in the world of the time. Now, does it work as well in our time? Uh, because you could, and of course, like all metaphors, it can be pushed way too far. You can get to all kinds of excesses. You can make it sound as if God really needed Jesus to suffer in order to love us again and to forgive us. God's own son, I mean, that's almost like a, a sadomasochist kind of God. So like all metaphors, if you push it too far, it becomes untrue. But in our time, we're coming up with other metaphors that might speak more effectively to our time. I'm thinking of somebody like Grace Jansen, the great English theologian, who is championing the whole notion of, Jesus, God became human among us in order for human flourishing, to enable humanization, emancipation, or the liberation theologian saying, it, to, to set us free. And of course, any one of those metaphors can go back and say, and quotes, you know, Paul, the Epistle to the Galatians, chapter 5, freedom is what we have, Christ has set us free. Uh, so they can all find their, their mirror and their resources in the New Testament, 
But at different times, we've raised up different metaphors and models to try to talk about what Jesus means for human history. And so it will always be. And some eras will pick metaphors that perhaps are more appropriate or more adequate or more effective or more resonant with that era than perhaps in another era. So in that sense, now I'm not saying that the notion of Jesus paying the price for us is not true at all. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, of course, it's, there's a great truth that will always be there. And, and, and when we sin, and we know that we, perhaps we commit a dreadful sin for which we cannot pay the price. To know that the price has already been paid for you in the dying and rising of Jesus can be an extraordinary Right, it can be an extraordinary source of, 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 of consolation. Uh, I've worked very closely with a dear friend who is in life for, prison, uh, for the rest of her natural life for a murder she committed, and, and she goes back to this metaphor all the time and finds great consolation in it. Uh, so they have their value, but perhaps in some contexts and cases are times and places more than others. Ones that I think will be true for all time, and take, I'm talking too much time here, my apologies, I'm going to wind down, what it would be, oh, I think Lent will always be a great practice. I think Advent will always be a great practice. Um, I, and, there, and there's some old practices that I would be very conservative about. I think Stations of the Cross. Uh, now, they were a later, in, well, they were fairly early in the history of the church, second or third century, when people started going to Jerusalem to follow the Via Crucis, the way that Jesus had walked, and then somebody said, let's bring it home with us, and then it began to appear in our churches. Um, so there are practices, but I, I think Lent, well, we're going to ask you this question. What, what practices do you think are, will, are, all, will, are still with us, that we should be bringing with us into the future? So I think Lent will always be a great time. The one that was never a good practice is Paul saying in Ephesians chapter 5, you know, wives obey your husbands. Uh, I don't think that was a good practice then. I don't think it's a good practice now, and I don't think it'll ever be a good practice. Or saying women be silent in church. I don't think that was a good practice back then. I don't think it's a good practice now. I don't think it'll ever be a good practice. It was never going to happen. Well, this is, <laughs> this is, this is probably true, but, but, but it wasn't. Uh, and it never will be. Uh, and of course, he, you could pick on him for say, Ephesians 5, is wives be submissive to your husbands. Of Ephesians 6 is slaves be obedient to your masters. And I don't think that was a good practice in Pauline in those time, in New Testament times. It hasn't been a good practice ever since. And it never will be a good practice, even though we did practice it. And we encourage people to practice it in the name of God, in the name of the, our faith, in the name of the gospel. Uh, I heard a sermon this past, this past summer uh, at a wedding of all places where somebody picked that unfortunate text and laid it out quite explicitly. Is, this is your responsibility because your, your husband is like Jesus Christ, you know, and, and knows what's best for you. It's God-awful. It'll never be wise. Let's not go back to it. Okay, all right. So there's need to reinterpret and represent the wisdom asking. And I think these are the criteria. And then I put your question to you. How do we know what to bring with us? I'm going to suggest a couple of criteria. I think the one that we ask is, what promotes holiness and wholeness of life? Uh, and for all people. And by the way, the great Joseph Goldbrunner said, holiness is wholeness. In other words, human flourishing and human holiness of life, right relationship with God, self, others, and creation. Uh, we need to bring a, a hermeneutics, as we would say in the technical language, hermeneutics of appreciation. We need to go back and, uh, with a certain sense that there's something here to uncover in the old past perspectives and practices and personalities to have a certain appreciation for it. But then, beyond appreciation, we also would have reservation uh, about its limitations, its shortcomings. It wasn't all perfect, far from it. I've said enough about that. And then imagination. So my, my, my proposal is that we bring hermeneutics, or interpretive tools, in other words, of appreciation. In other words, expecting to find good wisdom there, at least uh, in many of the practices, for our time, reservations about his limitations, its shortcomings. Interesting how the Holy Father reclaimed the rosary. Uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, when he went back to look at the rosary again, he saw a, a huge limitation in the rosary because the, five, the 15 decades that we had, if you remember, the, the, first, uh, the, the fifth joyful mystery ended with the finding of the child Jesus in the temple, Right? What was the first sorrowful mystery? The agony in the garden. In other words, we left out his life. 
There was nothing about the public life of Jesus. Multiplication of the loaves and fishes, instituting of the Eucharist, preaching the reign of God, the wedding feast of Cana. Nothing about his public life. And John Paul saw that, and that's why he put in the five new decades of the, the, these mysteries of light to focus on the life of Jesus. In other words, there was a limitation there. You can't say, oh, the rosary was wonderful. We said it every night when I was a kid growing up and giggled the whole way through it. And, you know, it was marvelous. <laughs> Uh, so, reser so uh, appreciation, reservation, and then imagination to create new or renewed spiritual wisdom, not to regress, but to reclaim for our time. For example, I give the example of this new evangelization, the rosary, the Friday abstinence, lots of examples, but let me wind on because I'm taking too long. You go to work. What would be an old practice, uh, pre, uh, by that I mean pre-Vatican II, I think. At least that's what we wrote the book about. We, the requirement for the uh, writing essays in this new collection uh, was that you uh, had to be over 60 because you had to remember the pre-Vatican II church. Uh, uh, so if anyone in there that denies the, their age, you'll know that if they're in that book, they're definitely over 60. I think there's one person that isn't. But um, think of an old practice, an old perspective or personality that might hold spiritual wisdom for us today. Write it down. Oh, be one of your favorites. And maybe think of one that you haven't gone back to in a while. One that you kind of have set aside, but you might want to revisit or reconsider. And how might we reclaim such wisdom for our time? Uh, as I said, you can't just regress to it. Um, how could you reclaim it? Let me invite you to turn, maybe not the whole table, because we uh, unfortunately getting a little bit of a late start. We'll take, I want Meg to have her for a full half hour here. Um, let's take two or three, let's take about three minutes with about two or three neighbors. Don't, in other words, not the whole table together, just the immediate neighbor to you. Turn and have a little chat for the next three to four minutes. All practices that are occurring to you this morning that you'd love to reclaim and bring with you somehow into the future journey of your own faith life or community. Let's go to work. We reassemble in about three to four minutes. There's a, a Brazilian poet, her name is Clarice Lispector, and she has a line and it goes something like this, life is always possible reinvented. And I think something like the Novena of Grace, I've seen with our own students at the uh, STM over time who are involved in parish ministries, recovering this tradition, which in part comes from the Society of Jesus, and basically reinventing it for 2010 in a way that uh, some of the, the, the prayers and the pattern of uh, the Novena of Grace uh, or however it manifests itself, sometimes not in a full nine days or a three days or four days, but working with it in a parallel way that allows the insights of our present age, our present moment, to be brought to bear on a long-standing tradition that does give rise to the desire of persons to be in community in a way that calls them as individuals as well as a community to go deeper in the process of ongoing conversion and transformation. So uh, that's a, a great insight. Thank you. Yes. No, it, it, there's a huge tradition in the church. It begins at the very beginning. You see it in the Didache, for example, a document from the, most scholars say the, first, the end of the first Christian century, the beginning of the second. But the proposal is that we fast in order to have more to give away. In other words, you didn't fast just to punish yourself for your sins, but rather you fasted to be in solidarity with people who are poor and in order to have something to share with them. Now, I mean, that's a great practice. So to return to that, not, and as I said, to return maybe to the Friday fast, and the Friday abstinence, 
not because it's a mortal sin if you have a hot dog or something, but because it's, it's, it gives you a solidarity with those who have no food. It's a great reminder. And as you say, it's a, a very healthy physical thing to do. And it can have that symbolic meaning of opening yourself, emptying yourself for the presence of God, for the grace of God. Uh, it could be a lovely aspect of our faith. I often think we made a mistake when we just came out 19, when was it? 50, uh, 60, 54, 50, 64? Whatever, it was way back there in any way. Uh, when we come and say, well, there's no longer a sin. Eat meat on a Friday. We didn't know why we weren't eating it anyway. But, 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 uh, and so, you know, uh, lock over, uh, you know, uh, Anthony's Pier 4 and the lobster dinner on a Friday night just went way down because <laughs> all the Catholics used to go to Anthony's for lobster on a Friday night. We didn't, we didn't have to anymore, you know what I mean? It wasn't a sin if you just had a steak uh, at lock overs instead. But there was a better way to do it because it was a great practice we could have brought with us. Another example or two in Mega Response. Well, it, right now, as some of you may know, there's a great resurgence in Eucharistic adoration, especially among young people, for those of you who are working with youth. And one of the, the serious problems uh, that I perceive with that is they, have, they embrace the practice, but have virtually no Eucharistic theology and they have no Holy Thursday experience as a point of reference for the practice of Eucharistic adoration. It's not contextualized in the Paschal Mystery. And they bring to it uh, an interpretation or interpretations that are both theologically and sacramentally unsound. But the thing is, there's not really occasions to dialogue and discuss about, uh, about this reality. And I think there's a way in which it ties in with the previous comment that for some reason in the course of our tradition, ascetical practices were coupled up with penitential practices. And I think uh, it's very important for us to engage in a process of uncoupling them so that both ascetical and devotional practices contribute to our life, to our giving, to our experiences of compassion and solidarity, and that they're outward moving, not only inward moving in terms of penitential, self-deprecating um, ideas connected with these devotional practices, which if any of you have seen some of these Eucharistic adoration gatherings with young people, what is pushed as an agenda is their fundamental unworthiness before the body of Christ. Now, what kind of a message does that communicate in terms of one's own unworthiness? We have to recognize that all of us are sinners, that we participate in our own individual sins and those of our world. But how is it that at that developmental stage, what you communicate is someone's fundamental unworthiness? That's what I mean about there's, there is a, an unsatisfactory, inadequate, and inappropriate theology and sacramental theology that it's hard to re-educate once those ideas have been internalized. I'll make a parenthetical comment to Megs and then uh, sit down and let her get on with her presentation. Just uh, following on from that, see, this is why the Jansenists caught on. The Jansenists sounded so pious and so that, I mean, in a sense, and in a sense they had a powerful point. Which one of us here is worthy of the Eucharist? Um, if we truly believe that this is the real presence, the body and blood presence of the risen Christ that we're encountering, which one of us is worthy? So in a sense, they, 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 they could easily play on, 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 us, on our, our spirituality. And yet it was a dreadful message that you're not worthy. It was as if the Eucharist is a reward for being worthy rather than a way to become more holy. Uh, and they caught on. 
And it's one of the things to be alert for, even in our time. I think in the history of the church, all of the great heresies were right-wing movements toward a more rigorous, a more that you're not worthy, you know, the, you know, the, you can, the Jansenists, the, the Manichaeans, the Nechetists, the Albigensians, they were all right-wing movements. We always think of heresy as to the left. Most of the great heresies in the history of the church have been to the right. And that's a powerful example of it. Enough said, my, Meg. Here's my friend Meg. Thank you so much. Well, just to pick up a little bit on the old and the new, uh, when uh, Father Motz introduced me, he, was, he said that I'm uh, currently the vice president and counselor for mission for my congregation of Franciscan sisters. And on this subject of Eucharistic adoration, I'm mindful that some of the uh, issues aren't only with Mike Sennon. All right, let's see. We are technologically challenged this morning. Can you hear now? Put it up further? Okay, I get it. How's this? Better? All right. So uh, one of the things that I'm conscious of is sometimes we'll have a beautiful liturgy on a Sunday, and we have a tradition in the congregation of adoration on Sundays, but I'm, I'm always amazed at how we've got to get through the Mass to get to the Eucharistic adoration. And so we have these theological uh, disconnects, um, and how is it that we communicate and reflect and help to orientate people in ways that contribute to a fuller, more adequate and appropriate theological stance. All right, so reclaiming Catholicism insights and images, what I'd like to do now is to um, be in dialogue a bit with Tom's earlier comments. And a couple questions that I want to ask, first of all, is whose treasures and practices are we reclaiming? So as you talked around your table, who introduced you to these treasures or practices? Uh, at, at, at what uh, treasure trove are you retrieving them or reclaiming them? And from what kind of Catholicism? From what kind of Catholicism are we reclaiming these? And what I'd like to put forth, just as a point of discussion, I'm, I'd like to look at two kinds of Catholicism, two kinds of Roman Catholicism. Now we know that there's as many ways as there are desires, so we probably could be talking about seven kinds of Catholicism, but I'm only going to talk about two right now. All right, there's what I would call the universal Roman Catholicism. Whoops, lost it. By universal, um, I want to suggest that in a universalized Catholicism, are we reclaiming the treasures and practices of those who embrace the universalized Roman Catholicism? And let me say a little bit about this. A universalized Roman Catholicism, as I understand it, is understood as those traditions and practices that are approved regulated and exported or imported from Western Europe and broadly imposed and appropriated across cultures so that the way the Stations of the Cross are celebrated in Lyon, France, is exactly the same way they're going to be celebrated or participated in in Tokyo, right? Or in Chicago or in Durban, South Africa. There's a way in which the ritual itself and the rhythm and everything that goes along with it is exported and imported in ways that are universalizing. And I want to emphasize here that this understanding of by whom is it approved, it's approved, regulated, and exported or imported with the authority of the church, all right? With the authority of the church. So 
there's a way in which this universalizing impulse at once holds the church together and provides us with a certain continuity across cultural boundaries, across nations, that has this universalizing impulse. And I'm not necessarily suggesting in any way that that is a negative. But it, in a way, as we reflect upon it, what we have found in recent years is that this universalizing impulse, if traditions and practices aren't in place, what is holding the church together universally in terms of its devotional practices? Now, these treasures and practices would be products of missionary activity, products of migration, because they weren't just sent in a FedEx box. People brought them. And the people that brought them weren't necessarily pastoral agents or priests or religious. It often were people in migration from these different countries who were emigrating to various other lands and countries throughout the world. They were also products of religious identity that helped to identify and intensify the religious identity of the Roman Catholic individual or the Roman Catholic community. But let me ask you this question. What or who gave or gives these treasures and practices their value? Now, the church can regulate them, all right? But in terms of how they are given value, who or what gives these traditions and practices value? And I'd ask you to turn to one another at your tables right now and just talk about this for a little bit. When we think about these traditions and practices, who is it or what gives these traditions and practices value? Just for a few minutes. Uh, I know from my own experience, my Irish dad uh, really embraced the works of mercy, and one of them that was particularly a part of our family was going to wakes and funerals. Uh, I remember as a child, I was about, you know, three, four years old, and we'd be going up to Walsh's funeral home just about every night. <laughs> and I, I came to discover it, it was an act of mercy, but it was also a vehicle for walking with my dad, stopping for ice cream, visiting with the neighbors along the way. So the work of mercy itself contributed to a larger sense of, of community. But I find in my own experience now that I am also moved when former uh, neighbors and old time friends of my parents pass away, that I'm at those wakes and funerals. And my friends look at me like, are you related to these people? <laughs> like the only time that one would go to a wake or funeral is when you're really intimately connected. And anyway, that's one of the treasures and practices that I think about myself that goes back to a, a family upbringing contextualized in the context of a faith community, but a treasure and a practice that isn't part of everyone's experience. All right, now I'd like to look, uh, differentiate a global understanding of Roman Catholicism from a universal understanding. So are we reclaiming the treasures and practices of those who embrace a global Roman Catholicism? And this is how I define a global Roman Catholicism. It's understood as those traditions and practices unapproved or disapproved of by the church unregulated or overregulated by the church because some of these treasures and practices church leaders have actually struggled to suppress and eradicate from communities. They are practices and treasures that have been transported from the entire world but narrowly exposed and conserved within cultures. So these treasures and practices are often contained within a culture. 
So they don't universalize. That doesn't mean that they don't transport to another cultural or national context, but the treasure traditions and practices don't universalize. All right? Let me see if I can give you some examples here. They tend to be artifacts of indigenous and folk piety. And this is whether you're coming from Bolivia or southern Italy, indigenous and folk piety. These are not universalized necessarily, but they are part of global Catholicism. They are represented not just in migration of peoples, large groups of people that then become assimilated into a larger church structure, as in migration, but diaspora, so that you have communities that are in diaspora essentially holding on to practices and treasured traditions that their neighbors know nothing about unless those individuals invite their neighbors into the practices. Okay? That's what I mean by global Catholicism. Do you get the differentiation between the universalized experience and the global experience? And before I was talking about the universalized experience, the issue there is intensification of religious identity. In these experiences, it's intensification of the interactive dynamic between religion and culture, between faith and culture, that somehow in those traditions, in those treasures and practices, the very culture of the people is also preserved linguistically, through food, through experiences. All right? I see heads nodding, so I guess you know what I'm talking about. So I'd ask once again the question, what or who gave or gives these treasures and practices their value? So, another few minutes at your tables. But an observation that, that I would like to make that I think resonates in this area of New England, and you'll know what I'm talking about. The universalized experience of Catholicism is what I'd call the upstairs church. The global experience is what I'd call the downstairs church, the gymnasium church, the room in the rectory church. But keep in mind that that upstairs church for the communities that built those churches at one point was a no church. There was no church. And those communities who today would be the basement communities, the gymnasium communities, the you know, recreational center communities, are now those communities that are bringing new life and energy to the church, but how do we make these connections between holding together this universal Catholicism and this global Catholicism? All right? There needs to be interpretation, mediation, communication, dialogue, and openness. But where does that begin? Where is the desire on the part of the church and its members to seek to discover and value the traditions and practices of others in terms of global Catholicism. Okay? So basically, everybody in this room has a foot in both worlds if we go back into our individual experiences and histories. Now, I would ask the question, and, and Tom's example of the bog, I think, is a wonderful, natural example to work with. He talked about the reclamation project. But I'd also like to suggest that involved in this is an experience of revelation. Because as the Irish government came in in the reclamation project of that bog, there was something about creation and an awareness 
of the Earth's capacity to bring forth new life that is not only about a project of reclamation, but also a project of revelation, God's project of revelation. And then the question is, do we have eyes with which to see it? How do we perceive what God is doing? Look, I am doing something new. How do you perceive it? For 50 years, people were slicing turf out of the bog. But now, I am doing something new. How do you perceive it? So how do we understand this relationship between the reclaiming process of our old traditions, treasures, and practices, and the revelation that is coming to us about traditions and practices which, while they may be ancient in the global community, they are new if we have eyes with which to see them. So I'll leave you with that thought and those questions. We're going to take a break for 15 minutes. But how many minutes, Melinda? Ten. <laughs> Ten minutes. All right. So hurry back. Maybe this would be a good opportunity to uh, give uh, Melinda a special thanks for all of her organization and orchestration of this event. as well as the supportive staff without which she wouldn't be able to pull all of these things off. So thanks to all of you very much. All right, well, let's keep on going here. You can hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. All right, enough on Revelation. Okay, so revealing universal Catholicism. What does this look like, and how does it connect? I'm going to be using... Marian devotions as a way to sort of explore what I'm trying to get at here. As I said earlier, uh, these treasures and practices are often ahistorical, these devotions that I'm going to be talking about. By ahistorical, I mean we practice the devotion, but we forget what were the historical circumstances under which that devotion emerged. Apolitical, we uncouple it from the political context. Uh, they're easily translatable. Uh, they're readily acculturated. There aren't any borders, and they're readily universalized. Also, I'd add that decontextualized piece. We forget, for example, that Lourdes is in France. You know, it, it, we're not thinking about the French context necessarily. So I'd like to give you a couple examples, and these may or may not resonate with your experience, but I suspect they will. So Our Lady of Fatima is a devotion, a devotion to Our Lady of Fatima, is basically uncoupled for our purposes as a universalized devotion from the actual historical political reality of Portugal at the time of the apparition. All right? Universalized for the church, this apparition, one of the guiding prayers for it was for the conversion of Russia. All right. But it was reclaimed later on as devotion to Our Lady of Fatima continues internationally for the conversion of nations. And I would ask the question, what's the revealing dimension to this? We've moved from the universalized appeal and prayer for the conversion of Russia to a revelation about the defenselessness of the vulnerable and the importance of Christian values. So where you see popular devotion to Our Lady of Fatima, extended in current communities, it is this point of what is now being revealed is this defenselessness of the vulnerable and the importance of these Christian values. Our Lady of Lourdes. 
It was universalized as a devotion, but it was uncoupled in its mediation from the historical, political, contextual realities of France at the time, or of Europe, actually. It was reclaimed to solidify Catholic teaching regarding the Immaculate Conception, because part of the revelation is, I am the Immaculate Conception. All right? But over time, in its revealing dimension, it has contributed to faith-based medical centers, the advancement of health care, especially for women and children. So do you see my point here, how we go from a universalizing process that decontextualizes, okay, but it contributes to a reclamation process that also carries within it the potential for a new revelation to be seen and to emerge. Our Lady of Guadalupe, universalized as the patroness of the Americas, but uncoupled from the colonial history of Mexico, from the Mexican Revolution, reclaimed to solidify Latin American, American Catholic identity through a single, remember earlier on I was talking about the regulation here? Through a single Marian apparition and devotion. Now, as someone who worked in Brazil for many years, I can tell you that the people of Brazil were just a slightly uncomfortable when Our Lady of Aparecida was pushed to the margins so Our Lady of Guadalupe could emerge as the single Marian apparition and devotion for the Church of the Americas. Does that resonate with anybody here who might be working with Cubans or Salvadorans or Ecuadorans or that their Madonnas and virgins are sort of pushed out of the arena of consciousness. So there's a way in which this universalizing principle um, has its advantages, but also some disadvantages. But with regard to the revealing aspect, the power and significance of Marian piety and devotion cannot be underestimated. This is not some throwback to pre-Vatican II days. We are finding there is an intense and ever-growing number of people engaged in these devotions and pilgrimages to these sites. La uh, in 2009, 6.1 million pilgrims converged between December 11th and 12th on the 478th anniversary of this apparition. This wasn't 6.1 million people over a whole year. This was in two days. But if you look at various sites of Marian pilgrimage, there is a way in which part of our treasure and our practices in the Catholic tradition remains this practice of pilgrimage. And what happens on pilgrimage? Now, you need a checkbook and a credit card in most cases, <laughs> all right, or a good friend to drive you or whatever. <coughs> but how is it possible for us to po recreate, we we're talking earlier about Holy Thursday, that movement to the seven churches, what is that if not a pilgrimage? How can we recover and restore, perhaps, from our treasured practices this experience of pilgrimage from community to community. Uh, we may never get to Knock or to Lourdes or to Fatima or to Mexico, but what about that treasure and practice of pilgrimage remains important for us? Now let's look for a minute at revealing in terms of the global aspect of Roman Catholicism. These treasures and practices are historical, 
They don't occur unless everybody in that community is aware of the history, the context, and the politics that gave rise to that devotion. They're not easily translatable. They involve enculturation. They require border crossing and they intensify the particularity of the community. And let me give you some examples here. Our Lady of Knock. All right, anybody seen this before? Any hands in this room? All right. Localized in County Mayo, Ireland. Globalized by Irish in diaspora. Now this is not a linguistic thing because people would speak English, all right? And Monsignor John Horan, who they named the airport after, an international airport there, uh, now no longer named after him, but it was reclaimed by descendants of Irish immigrants who do what? Make that great pilgrimage back to Ireland and this shrine becomes a centerpiece to that pilgrimage. But what is the revealing dimension here is ethnic pride, historical memory, and the interactive dynamic of faith and culture. Are you with me on this? But there's not a lot of Polish and Lithuanian people necessarily from the US going on these pilgrimages. So you see what I mean going back? It's historical, contextualized, political, not easily translatable, involves enculturation. It would require border crossing from other ethnic groups to participate. You gotta cross into the borders. And it intensifies the particularity of the experience of faith and culture. Our Lady of Levang localized in Hai Phu in the county of Mai Lin in the province of Quan Tri in central Vietnam. Globalized by Vietnamese in diaspora. Okay? Diaspora is different from migration, qualitatively. Migration is often undertaken by choice. The circumstances of suffering or hunger or lack of jobs may be real, but migration is generally a choice in movement. Diaspora, however, suggests that there is another socio-political economic force that usually involves some form of persecution or human suffering that moves people out of where they are to wherever they can get to in order to be safe, all right? Within a generation or two, that usually regulates itself, but it often means that people can't go back even if they would want to, all right? It's reclaimed by the descendants of Vietnamese immigrants, handed down, passed on. It reveals ethnic pride, historical memory of persecution and starvation, and once again, the interactive dynamic of faith and culture. Now for members of the Vietnamese community that are worshiping in a single church or in a basement church or in a um, gymnasium church, how is it that the universal church crosses the boundaries, seeks to know, to see with new eyes what is being revealed by this devotional practice that is a treasure and a practice that is revealing something to the whole church, to global Catholicism about the historical, political, contextual memory of Vietnamese Catholics, but is mediated through this devotion. Our Lady of Czestochowa, located in Czestochowa, Poland at Jasnogora Monastery, globalized by Polish in diaspora, reclaimed by descendants of Polish immigrants, revealing again ethnic pride, pride historical memory of invasion, of resistance, of persecution, and once again the interactive dynamic of faith and cultural identity. 
Our Lady of Aparecida, Eugenia, as we call her in Brazil, who was a little displaced there by Our Lady of Guadalupe. Globalized by Brazilians in diaspora, reclaimed by descendants of Brazilian immigrants, revealing national pride, historical memory of suffering, slavery, and interactive dynamic of faith and culture. In Brazil, there's a custom uh, on the feast day of Our Lady of Aparecida, October 12th, where rose petals are dropped uh, in honor of Our Lady of Aparecida. Well, one of the Brazilian priests who's working here in the Archdiocese of Boston contracted with a helicopter pilot who on the feast of Our Lady of Aparecida, I'm afraid all the people in Brighton were wondering, why is this <laughs> helicopter here and why is it dropping rose petals? or actually it was Alston. But these are the sorts of things. What new eyes of that community in Alston are, what is this helicopter and where are these rose petals? Are we asking the questions that would contribute to a greater understanding of who we are as church, the big church? So the spiritual wisdom of Marian devotion with regard to universal Catholicism is it moves from generation to generation in what I would call an Abrahamic, going back to Abraham, Magnificat narrative, which reveals hopes of flourishing and prosperity. What's the story about Abraham? I will be faithful, and what will I have? I'll have lands, I'll have descendants, I'll have cattle. Hopes of flourishing and prosperity are connected to the spiritual wisdom of these Marian devotions of universal Catholicism. So some of these can be mediated traditionally, often through religious orders, devotion to Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Our Lady of the Rosary, Our Lady of Sorrows, Our Lady of Perpetual Help. But these are just examples. You could go on and on. Um, but spiritual vitality I'm playing that off against spiritual wisdom, of Marian devotion of global Catholicism isn't from generation to generation. It's from crisis to crisis. And it's what I would call a Naomic Magnificat narrative. Naomi, you remember the story of Ruth and Naomi. What I want to emphasize here is Naomi is every bit as faithful as Abraham. This isn't a Job narrative where you lose everything and you get it all back at the end. She gets nothing back. Her husband dies. Her two sons die. Her daughters-in-law are left widows. She's faithful, but on the terms of Abraham's promise of flourishing and prosperity, that is not her end. Under. I want to emphasize that these devotions are not devotions that we're recovering necessarily from the past, but we're asked, asked to see with new eyes. So Our Lady of Cabehu is one of uh, an apparition that occurred, not totally recognized by the church. Lots of political, historical, social circumstances in Rwanda. But what was this apparition about? It was anticipating the genocide. That was the revelation anticipating the genocide. And now we look at the reality of Haiti. And we ask ourselves, what kind of treasures and devotional practices do we reclaim or do we see with new eyes as we stand in solidarity with the devastation of the people of Haiti? Crisis to crisis to crisis. And so I would just like to conclude uh, in this section, leaving you with a question. As you think about Marian devotion or Marian piety, how does it serve as a point of entry or a point of access into recovering, discovering within our larger Catholic community insights about who we are called to be at this moment in time. How does Marian devotion, whatever devotion it may be, provide us a point of entry, either universal or global, 
into who we are being called to be at this moment in time as church. So once again, I'd ask you um, to talk with the person next to you. You might want to switch persons uh, so you have, have an opportunity to talk with somebody else. And uh, we'll do this for about uh, three or four minutes, okay? Um, when you're ready, we'll regather. A thought, a comment, an insight for Meg that in response to her presentation, I found it fascinating. I've never thought, I've never thought through the, the, the difference between the global and the universal, but I think it's a very helpful, two very helpful categories. Anybody want to offer us a good thought, an insight you had in response to Meg's second piece of presentation? I was asking her, why did, why did Fatima and Lourdes make it and knock didn't, you know, but <laughs> I don't know why, why, why they picked on knock, you know, but, but it is, it, the Irish flock to Lourdes and, and, and Fatima as well. You're going to say? Oh, what a fascinating thought, yeah. Got it. comment that you make, I, I think, is so important at this point in time. It's not only she's mentioned more than Jesus, she's mentioned more in the Quran than she is in the New Testament. But this whole experience of Miriam bin Isa, Mary the mother of Jesus, or Jesus the son of Mary, uh, in Ephesus, uh, there is a well, Mary's well, where both Muslim and Christian women gather. And I think this highlights for us the way in which Mary, um, the, the scriptural Mary, not just the devotional Mary of the apparitions and the manifestations, but the trajectory of Mary within the Gospels and, and, I, and uh, the Acts of the Apostles, I, Tom will talk a little bit more about this, uh, is also part and parcel that that we hold together what is authoritative from our biblical tradition as well as what is part of our devotional piety. And how do we enter those different access points of Mary's trajectory from the Annunciation through to Pentecost. So thank you so much for that comment. Marvelous, and thank you for it. I, did any, I never knew that before. So that's a wonderful gift to us today and how often she's mentioned in the Quran. And Meg's comment is a perfect segue into the brief comments I'm going to make for the next 20 minutes or so and then give it back to you for the, some discernment. And that is that as we reclaim Mary, that we are called to reclaim not simply the Mary of faith, but also the historical person, the Mary of the Gospels. And this has been one of the, uh, so this can, this is, surely has to universalize all of our devotions to Mary. Because just as the Christ of faith has to be grounded in the Jesus of history, the, the fellow that walked the roads of Galilee uh, and, and calling us to feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty and clothe the naked and so on and, and including the marginalized and, and, uh, and uh, reaching out to the, to the, to the sick and the, the downtrodden and saying that he'd come to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. Um, that's, that's the Jesus of history, but that Jesus of history has to always color the Christ of faith, the one, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Son of God that we believe in as our Savior and Redeemer and, and Liberator. So, in other words, we can't have a Jesus, a Christ of faith and a Jesus of history if there's two different people. Likewise, we can't have a Mary of apparitions and faith if she isn't consistent with and echo the Mary of history and the Mary of the Gospels. And one of the great gifts of contemporary scholarship, and especially among feminists, and, well, not just feminists, but women theologians, I should say, um, uh, and, uh, is the reclaiming of Mary. Uh, the reclaiming of the Mary of the Gospels. And so the, the, the great theologians of our time, Elizabeth Johnson, for example, Mary Hines here at Emmanuel, uh, 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 Catherine Marie Lacuna, some of the great women theologians of the Catholic tradition have gone back and in a sense brought us back again with a certain kind of second naivete uh, to look again at the Mary of the Gospels and, and, and to reclaim her. And she becomes again an extraordinary refurbish, reclaimed figure for us. And, and in a sense, before we have added all the accretions of history and all of the titles that we've given her, sometimes jaw-breaking titles, media tricks and co-redemptrix and 
bag of tricks or whatever you want to say. I mean, I mean, so that before we get into all of that, let's always ground ourselves in the Mary of the Gospels. Now, you can say, well, you know, the Gospel, are the, you know, the, are the infancy narratives historically true? Well, th what we have in the Gospels is the witness of the faith of the first Christian communities. That's always what we have. And so our faith should mirror and reflect and be grounded in the faith of the first Christian communities. So when you go there, then you can begin to see why we give her pride of place in our communion of saints. She, she totally deserves it. Uh, this unwed, what you find is an unwed teenage mother. Uh, and then very soon thereafter, a political refugee. I mean, no wonder she's had such extraordinary appeal to the downtrodden and, and, the, and the marginalized over, over throughout history. Why did Jesus, where did he get his values? I mean, why did he come into that synagogue on a Sabbath day in Nazareth, his hometown, and go looking for the text of Isaiah? The Greek word there is heurisko, and they're typically translated as he found the text. Well, heurisko means he looked for the text. He went looking for the text of Isaiah 61, um, uh, that, that God had anointed him to bring good news to the poor, liberty to captives, sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim God's year of favor. I mean, where did he get that kind of, where did he get those kind of values? Um, how did he, where did he get his extraordinary uh, commitment to, to radical love? I mean, in some ways, ridiculous love. I mean, to love your enemies, uh, to love those who hate you, to pray for those who persecute you. Where did he get that extraordinary sense of love of God, love of neighbor, love of self, as if they're all intertwined, as if they're all one love, the greatest commandment. When the, when the scribe in Mark asks, asks him, what is the greatest commandment? He says, that, love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, and that's the greatest commandment, singular. And at the end of it all, he will not say to us, I was, uh, he will not say there was a hungry person one time and you fed them. But rather, I was hungry, you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. In other words, this love of God, love of neighbor, love of self, all interwoven, uh, brought together. Deuteronomy uh, 6, verse 5, with Leviticus uh, 19, 18. Love of God, love of neighbor, love of self. A very radical understanding. A neighbor to include everyone. Not just fellow or sister Jew, but all people. Even enemies. Where did he get that sense of love? Where did he get his commitment to feeding the hungry? Six times, there's only, one, there's only two miracles recounted six times in the Gospels. The miracle of the resurrection and the miracle of the loaves and fishes. It's in all four Gospels and it's in Ma Mark and Luke, or Matthew. It's in, in two of the Gospels twice. Uh, these miracles of feeding the hungry. It must have been a central aspect of his, of his mission. Uh, how did he know to include women completely, fully, apparently, in his public ministry? It says clearly of these women at the foot of the cross, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke says it states it clearly, uh, Mary Magdalene and these other women had come up from Galilee with him. In other words, they've been with him from the beginning. And if you take John's chronology, that means they were with him for the three years of his public ministry. With him from the beginning, with him at the end, at the foot of the cross. Except in John's gospel, John is at the foot of the cross. I'm sure he was. I'm not doubting it at all. Ah... <laughs> uh, but what, how did he get that kind of inclusivity? How, how, to be talking to a Samaritan woman, a, a sinful woman, a, a woman and, and at least three, treble jeopardy. A woman, a Samaritan, and then a sinful woman. Uh, and yet here he's explaining his gospel to her, the heart and soul of what he was about. And, and, and then the disciples returned from the village where they'd gone to buy food and they were amazed to find him talking to a woman. But how did he get that kind of inclusivity? And for lepers and tax collectors and gathering everybody being welcome at the table. I mean, the most excluded and marginalized and despised people, he assembled them. According to Mark's gospel, it was, why, it was, why the, very, it was the, first, the first attempt by the Pharisees and so on to begin to plot to kill him was because of the inclusivity of his table fellowship. Where did he get those values? Now, you could cheat. You could say, well, he was the son of God. <laughs> and of course, you would be correct. <laughs> but the dogmas and doctrines of our faith, Chalcedon says very clearly, yes, he was fully divine and fully human, but that the divinity never compromised the humanity, that he wasn't pretending to be human. He was fully human. Uh, he wasn't just lying there in the manger saying, ga, 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 but really saying, wait till I grow up, you're going to be so surprised. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, he wasn't, nor, was he, nor was he just pretending to be hanging there on that cross for us. He was there. So the divinity never suspended the humanity, which is why the Catechism of the Catholic Church states very clearly, in other words, he had to learn. He had to be taught through experience, through instruction. The same the way all of us learn. Now, of course, he's the fullness of God's revelation in human time and place. We believe that. But he also had to be reared. He had to be taught. So who, who taught him? I mean, take a look at the Magnificat. And you'll get a sense of the kind of a God she believed in. A God who puts down the mighty from their thrones and raises up the lowly. Who fills the hungry with good things and sends the rich away. Whew, empty handed. Uh, and whose mercy endures forever, forever, forever. Always, always mercy. This radical God that she believed in. I'm totally convinced. Well, let, let me come back to this. Let me do the finding in the temple. It's my favorite. I'm only going to do a couple of these. But look sometimes. Go to the, that gospel again, Luke chapter 2. But go to it now thinking of Mary not as some kind of of, of beautiful woman up on a pedestal and snakes snipping at her feet and stars around her head. You know, that's the imagery that comes to us out of so much of our iconography. But go to her and look at her again as this terrified mother that had just lost her 12-year-old son. Go to her as a human mother and take a look at that experience again. Can you imagine it? The text of Luke says that they'd gone a day's journey before they even missed the kid. Now... <laughs> Can you imagine Joseph and Mary talking to each other? I thought he was with you. I never said he was coming home with my people. You said he was coming home with your people. I never said he was coming home with my people. And then God helped them. They, 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 they stagger back into Jerusalem frantic. I mean, just imagine their only child, their only son lost in a dreadfully dangerous city. I mean, and then Luke says that it's two days later. Now he's missing three days. When they finally, the last place they look is the temple. And there he is. And Mary looks in and sees him, and according to Luke, Mary walked in, cool as a cucumber, <laughs> and said, Son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have sought you with anxiety. I'll put my life on it. That's not exactly what happened. <laughs> Can't you imagine Mary charging into that temple, scooping him up in her arms, smothering and hugs and kisses. Oh my God, are you all right? Did anybody hit you? Are you bleeding? Are you okay? Oh my God. Joseph, give him, give him, give him a hug. Joseph, oh my, we'd be worried sick about you. And then she said, Joseph, oh my God. And then I think Jesus made a kind of a 12-year-old boy remark. I have a little, I have a 10-year-old boy at this stage in my life. I know, Abraham is now my, my patron saint. Uh, but so Je Je she, she, Jesus turns, I think he made a 12-year-old kid and he said, Ma, you should have known where to look for me. Now, we're not told what happened next. <laughs> but that poor lad did not leave home again till he was 30 years of age. <laughs> and then Luke says, and he grew. He then, well, well, Luke says, he went down to Nazareth and was obedient to them. <laughs> I bet he was. Scared the life out of the poor kid. And then Luke says, and he grew in wisdom, age, and grace before God and all the people. Well, who, who grew him? He grew in wisdom, age, and grace. So the extraordinary influence that she had on him and on, G on and Joseph, the extraordinary love relationship there must have been. Now, we won't go through all of these, but, but you look at Cana. I mean, he, he, he's not that terribly empathetic or worried about the fact that these poor kids have run out of wine. She's the one out front saying, oh my God, they're going to be so embarrassed. You know, they're out of wine at their wedding. And, and maybe it was because, Jesus, you brought so many of your disciples and brought so many of your friends. You know, and oh, but they could really drink. I mean, I won't tell you the, I won't tell you the Irish story of St. Peter the wedding, after the wedding, feast, uh, the wedding feast of Cana. But, but, but she goes to him and says, son, they're out of wine. He says, ma, my time has not yet come. I'm not ready. She said, you'll be ready. Fill the water pot. <laughs> Which one of us has not had that kind of maternal exchange on a number of occasions? And, she, and so he, she sponsors the first, his first miracle. And you can go on from there. The Last Supper. Now, this is where you're going to leave me. Because it's maybe heretical, but I don't think it is. I'm totally convinced that she was at the Last Supper. Now, let me tell you why I'm convinced of that. It's the most sacred night, the most family night, of the Jewish faith. 
Passover. And I think the scholars agree that now that the Last Supper was a Passover meal. She's in Jerusalem because she's at the foot of the cross the next day. Now, how could a good Jewish son get together for the Passover meal and not have his mother present? Uh, and what Jewish mother would tolerate that kind of, that kind of, she'd have brought him home to have the Passover meal with his family. Um, now, I know she's not, she wasn't there when they took, when Salvador Dali and, and uh, Leonardo da Vinci took the photo, but, <laughs> but it's difficult to imagine why she wouldn't be there. Now, you might say, Tom, if she was there, that would surely be recorded. Well, remember the miracle of the loaves and fishes? They said there was 5,000 men there, not counting women and children. In the world of the time, women and children usually were not recorded. It doesn't matter whether she was or she wasn't. It really doesn't, in the sense, it doesn't solve any great debates in our church or anything like that. I'm not implying that. But I think the women and children had to be there, at least in my faith. I can't imagine them not being there. And I don't think it does anything one way or the other. Uh, in fact, I, I think to leave them out and not to imagine them being there. Um, she's certainly at the foot of the cross. She's at the foot of the cross. What a heartbreak for this woman, her only son, to watch him die that dreadful death. And Acts chapter 2 makes very clear that she was there at Pentecost. It's one of the ways that our artists have misled us over the, over the, over the history. Some paintings of Pentecost have a gathering, but most of them have, you know, the 12 men and the Holy Spirit, the bird coming down upon them, and tongues of fire. And some have include Mary. But if you look at Acts chapter 1 verse 15, it says there were about 120 people in the upper room, including Mary and the women disciples. So, and then Acts 2 it says that the Holy Spirit descended upon all their present. So, she was present at Pentecost, received the Holy Spirit the same way as all of the apostles and disciples received it, as did all of the women disciples that were present there as well. In other words, the Spirit at Pentecost was not given simply to the apostles alone. We often graphically represent it that way, but according to our scriptures, it's not true at all. First to place Jesus in the tabernacle of the world. Who was to, the first to create the body and blood of Christ in the tabernacle of her own womb? And then so with memory and imagination to pray again the Hail Mary. We're going to do it as part of our ritual at the end of this morning. Uh, that we go back to it again. And, and I love that second, the second piece, Holy Mary, Mother of God. Now that was a great debate in the early Christian community, this Theotokos. Could we give her such a title? I mean, how could you attribute such a title to an ordinary human being, uh, to, to be the mother of God? And if you look back and hear, read the history of the theological debates at that time, there were great theologians and indeed some many bishops who waffled and who said, yeah, let's, you know, let's back off from that one. It's too much of a claim for Mary. And it was the ordinary people, which goes back to Meg's point, it was the faith, the census fidelium, the sense of the faithful people who rose up and insisted and said, no, we claim he was the son of God. She bore him in her womb. She's the mother of God. Now, what an extraordinary title to give to a human being. Ah, we can pray again, I believe, with the Hail Mary. Um, let me just wind out of this but because we have focused on the reclaiming of Mary historically in faith, in culture, uh, and so on. But also, let's go back to where we began. There are great treasures throughout this tradition of ours to be reclaimed. Let me mention just a few in passing, give it back to your conversation, and, uh, and then we'll move on. Perspectives. The book actually outlines people, practices, and perspectives that we might reclaim. Uh, and we've invited some of the great, it's like a who's who uh, of, of an uh, thank you, Rich, for buying this little book. Teddy always needs shoes. And, and, uh, uh, but it's like a who's who of American Catholicism. And it was fascinating because we got some of our great progressive and forward-looking theologians to go back and do this exercise. Everybody's in here from Avery Dulles to Dick McBrien. But, but we asked John Baldwin to go back, a great, one of our great stars here at the School of Theology and Ministry, a renowned, world-renowned uh, liturgical theologian, to go back and look again at, at the Mass and some of the old perspective, the sense of mystery, the sense of awe, the sense of aura of reverence that was there, that we don't quite get. You can, but how do we reclaim that, this sense that, that it had the ability, that it was a mediation 
between God and, and, and earth, that it was the thinnest place we know. In Celtic spirituality, we talk about a thin place. It's a place where the veil between the divine and the human is lifted, or at least becomes gossamer thin. And in a sense, the old mass and liturgy and way we celebrated had that sense of, of that it was an immediate encounter with the presence of the risen Christ, that God was with us indeed. And, and to retain that uh, in how we celebrate the liturgy today. Um, we went back and looked at sin. We asked Charlie Curran, again, a great progressive, forward-looking Catholic, Catholic moral theologian, and said, Charlie, do we need to reclaim some sense of our own awareness of our sinfulness, not just, as I said, our, our issues? Uh, is there a healthy guilt that should prompt us to conversion? Is there a way of reclaiming, what our friend here said earlier, this sacrament of reconciliation and being assured of God's mercy? I told a story yesterday in class, I'm going to repeat very briefly. I was teaching somebody who's a dear, a dear mentor to both myself and Meg, Paulo Freire. And Paulo Freire, the great Brazilian educator, a great architect and contributor to liberation theology, an amazingly radical Catholic Christian throughout his life, um, and, and as I said, a great liberationist in all of his theology and pedagogy. He taught for us here a number of summers, and I had the privilege of teaching with him. And uh, one, one night, we, I, somebody asked him, said, Paolo, what is your first memory, your longest memory, your defining memory of liberation, of being set free? And he told this story. It's a slightly risque story, but you're old enough, I think, to hear it. <laughs> he said, my first memory in my village, he said, he said there, was a, there was a river that flowed outside the village, and that is where everybody went to wash, to swim, to wash their clothes. But there was a tradition. Every afternoon from 2 o'clock to 4, the men never went down to the river because that's when the women went down to the river, both to bathe and to wash their clothes. Many of these, being poor people, only had one set of clothes, so they took off all their clothes in order to wash themselves in the river, and they washed themselves and washed their clothing in the river and then set them out to dry. But there, really, there was a strict rule in the village, you never peeked over the hill. Uh, the men didn't peek over the hill between 2 and 4 in the afternoon. Well, Paolo had just reached puberty, he was 12, 13, 14 years of age, and he became enormously curious to peek over the hill and to see for himself what these wonderful naked women's bodies might look like. So he did. But then, remember, this had to be a dreadful sin. And that, what was he going to tell his mom, especially since he didn't, couldn't, felt he couldn't receive Eucharist on Sunday, that he had done what should never have done. So he decided, well, he'd go to confession on Saturday. So he approached the confessional in fear and trepidation because of the enormity of his sin. First of all, he began by confessing that, to the priest that he had committed adultery. Uh, <laughs> he knew that it was in some area of that genre, you know. And so the priest looked at him and said, Paolo, the Paolo priest knew him well, said, Paolo, how, how, how did you do that? And he told him, so the priest burst out laughing. <laughs> and Paolo was somewhat offended. He repeated, he, he was there because of a very serious sin, and here the priest was giggling. And he said, Paolo, that is wonderful, that is marvelous. This is a marvelous moment in your life. It means you are growing up, you are becoming a man, you have reached puberty. This is beautiful. Our sexuality is a great gift of God, and God loves you, Paolo. It was, it, you're just being a little curious, maybe a little too curious, but don't worry about it, Paolo. So Paolo then said, you mean I can go back again, Father? <laughs> And the father said, the priest said, well, maybe, maybe, well, you decide, Paolo. He said, it, 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 you, will, you will stop going back very soon. And Paolo said, I went one more time, and then, yeah, I never went back again. He'd seen, you know, what a woman's body looks like, and he was, you know, he moved on with his life. But he said, I came out of that confessional. He said, it was as if I'd been set free. And he said, not just set free from, my, from that, what I thought was this dreadful sin, but set free. In my, own, in my own sense of myself as a man, as a person, in my own sexuality, that God was pleased with it. There was a gift of God to my life, not a terrible, sordid part of my identity, but a beautiful, wonderful grace. He said, this priest, in about five minutes, turned my whole attitude around toward myself and who I am and becoming. But he said it was a liberation. But like, you would hear a pin drop in the place as he told the, the story, we about 200 students in the co that course that summer because nobody expected him to say confession as a source of great liberation. Maybe it could be again with proper reclaiming in our time. Priesthood.
Donald Cousins wrote the essay in Priesthood, talks about the whole need for a great re renewal, reform, reclaiming of priesthood, this holy order that, that is a sacrament among us. And by the way, hierarchy, as holy order, doesn't mean hierarchy as we typically think of it, you know, cardinals, archbishops, bishops, archbishops, you know, monsignors, pastors, down to the, you know, it, it's, that is not the original meaning of hierarchy. Hierarchy means literally holy order, and it's the opposite of anarchy, anarchy. And holy order literally means getting people to work well together. In other words, priesthood doesn't mean doing it to us, doing it for us, doing it over us, but rather doing it with us, enabling us to become a body of Christ in the midst of the world, and of course, uh, with this great sacramental economy. So it doesn't mean a pedestal at all. It means, it, and of course, throughout the Gospels, again, six times. And he never, there were not too many things he said six times. There, there's two miracles repeated six times, but there's one statement repeated six times, and that's the warning to the disciples not to lord it over people. Uh, and says, you know, you're not to lord it over other people. And yet, we've constructed our ministries very often with a certain kind of clericalism that is indeed hierarchical in that levels of command sense. So there's a great retrieval and reclaiming to be done there. We look at some personalities. Madel the great Madeleva Wolf, poet, scholar, educator, wrote 20 books, founded a Catholic college for women, Salt Lake, 27 years, president of St. Mary's College, Indiana, founded his school of theology, the first for women to obtain advanced degrees in theology, championed the education of sisters. This is back in the 1940s, the 1950s. An extraordinary pioneer, an extraordinary pioneer. Um, uh, Ted Hesburgh, of course, and I'm out of time, not because he's the president of Notre Dame, uh, <laughs> but really, one of the great Catholic educators, an extraordinary man, an amazing Catholic educator, and again, in a difficult time. He's still alive, thank God, uh, served on 11, on 14 presidential committees, was a great leader of the Civil Rights Commission, championed to racial justice, a guy received the Medal of Great Giants of our faith in this country, from whom we can still learn a great deal. And of course, Dorothy Day. Won't it be a great day when we canonize her finally? Uh, this uh, band, you know, this woman, this bohemian lifestyle, uh, uh, admits quite clearly in her autobiography that she indeed experienced an abortion in her life, lived in a common law marriage, a, 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 a child out of wedlock, uh, and yet, this extraordinary saint, what a hope what she gives for, for all of us. Uh, the co-founder of Peter Marr, this Catholic worker movement, this pacifist lay community, compassion, justice, direct action, nonviolence, uh, radically committed to the dignity of every person, the responsibility of the church to the poor. You know, if Jesus was to come back and say, where do I find my church? Um, it would be in the places where the, especially, I think, where people who are, are working in the Dorothy Day tradition. Uh, practices like praying to the saints for the souls, this lovely sense of the bond of baptism is never broken. And while I could ask my mother to pray for me when she was living, I could say the same thing to her this morning because I know she's in the presence of God. Uh, and she, we don't, theologically we don't pray to the saints. We ask the pray, saints to pray with us because the saints cannot answer our prayers but they can pray with us. So when you look at the litany of the saints, it's Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Kevin, pray for us. Saint Benedict, Saint, Saint Augustine, whoever. Saint Monica, Saint uh, uh, Teresa. It's pray for us, pray for us, pray for us. In other words, we ask them to pray with us because they still can. Um, and, and I love the sense, uh, the saints are models of holiness and hope. They can pray for us, they can pray with us. And yet, that was my saintly mother, as the poet Yeats would say, she hurried home to God. And yet my Uncle Tom, I don't know. I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think he rambled and wandered, at least he did in life. So after death, I imagine him taking high roads and byways as well. And so what do we do? Well, we can, I can pray for him. I can, I can do an act of love, an act of justice. I can have mass celebrated for his eternal rest. And that somehow, and this is all dangerous stuff. I mean, some of this, this was the powder keg that Luther struck and put a match to that exploded as the Protestant Reformation because there was such simony and buying and selling of indulgences and all kinds of horrible abuses and misuses and you give enough money to the renovation of this church, your granny will be in heaven for supper and all kinds of craziness. And yet when the church reassembled at the Council of Trent, they said, no, there's still a value. 
here. It is, I love the sense of purgatory because it's the sense that our God cuts us a bit of slack. That if you don't have it all entirely and completely all together, by the time you die, eh, you get another chance. You don't have, no, you'd be better off to have it all together. Uh, don't, don't mishear me. My sense of purgatory is a room where you're going to show up and you're going to meet all the people that you were hoping to God you'd never, ever, ever <laughs> see again. They'll all be there. So if you have people like that in your life, go make friends before you die because if you don't, you'll have to get it right afterwards. Why? Because you couldn't be in the presence of a God of loving, right relationship, a triune, right relation, loving, right relationship. How could you be in the presence of such a God and be in wrong relationship with somebody? So you'd have to get it right. I went back to see an old pastor of mine of 40 years ago in Dodge City, Kansas. I went to visit him recently in a retirement home. And my memory of him was a very negative memory. But an old friend who knew some of the memories said to me, why did you ever go see that guy? And I said, to save myself time in purgatory. Because <laughs> I'd have to make things up with him before we could be in the presence of God. But... It, as I said, all kinds of abuses, misuses, superstitions have, have grown up around this. And yet, a great value that we can pray for them. They can pray with us. They're not nearly as dead as you think. Uh, they're all there in the presence of God or the potentially in the presence of God. Uh, it's a lovely part of the tradition. Lent is a time of metanoia, the Baltimore Catechism, indeed excessive detail, and yet... Uh, a few dogmas, lists of scriptures we might well do to know by heart. Finally, take your pen and paper. Let's invite you back to think some more about other treasures that come to mind for now. What to reclaim from them. So pick a couple. Don't go home with a whole bag of things. Pick one or two practices, perspectives, or personalities that you might go back to look at or in your own sense of Mary and, and the role and place of Mary in our Catholic Christian faith. That one in particular, since we did such focus on it and Meg did such fine work on it, how would you maybe reclaim or rethink the place of Mary in your faith? Um, how to go about it? What decisions might be emerging for your own faith life? Let me give you a little quiet time. We'll bring you back to your neighbor for a few minutes and then we'll both hear some of your some of what you've recognized, come to see for yourself from this morning, and then perhaps decisions you might be making as well. And then we'd break for our prayer time and for lunch. Well, let's hear some thoughts, comments, insights, decisions. Um, feel free to raise questions, of course, but better by far if you raise answers rather than quest simply questions. And Meg is looking for an image of our Blessed Mother to bring up for our prayer time, but she'll be part of the conversation as well. What are you deciding? What are you bringing home? Um, yes, yourself. Good and loudly, if you maybe, ri maybe rise. Thank you. Ah, here's, here's my, uh, uh, Joelle with a camera. Here we are. Oh, really? it's oh, Thanks, Joelle. <laughs> Something that Talk really touched me was uh, when you mentioned, where did he get all that radical type of love? And just thinking about, you know, Mary, his mother, I'm sure was a big part of that, yes. going to his Heavenly Father. But Mary, with her, her yeah. thoughts and all, and Joseph. brought out Joseph. and Joseph, yeah, right. Joseph. Because we, we think that Joseph probably died when Jesus was Early, probably... Because right. Joseph was an older man and people didn't live very long in those days. So the, long, the, the life expectancy was quite short. And it is fairly clear from the Gospels that Joseph was dead by the time he went into public ministry. Because it says that Mary and his brothers and sisters came looking for him. It doesn't mention Joseph again. But, but, so, but initially, he, he got his trade. He got his trade from Joseph. You know, he says... He, he, he's the carpenter's son. Um, yeah, so Joseph would have mentored him and sponsored him in all kinds of ways as well. And in the world of the time, too, they said that you know, there would have been a lot of chat when people came by the carpenter's shop to pick up their new chair or whatever, their new donkey's cart, uh, that there would be lots of conversation. A lot of it would have been about Torah and about their faith and what was going on. So a lot of the conversation around the carpenter's shop would have been, which Joseph would have been anchoring, 
obviously influenced his values and outlook in life as well.